A government announces that they will reach net zero carbon emissions after 10 years. Assuming that the government does indeed follow through, which they rarely do, does this mean that all paths to net zero have the same outcome? Let's think of it as a graph, with the amount of years passed on the x-axis and the carbon emissions on the y-axis. The only conditions we are given is that we must have a y value of 0 when x has a value of 10. For the sake of demonstration, let's use Australia's 15 metric tons of emissions for the starting y value. Now there are multiple ways we can descend from this value to this value. We could have a clean linear descent or a much bumpier ride. Honestly, it's your choice. Though we're going to focus on two specific paths. Perhaps the government chose to not really change these first couple of years. Though under pressure from the public, they push emissions down drastically at the last minute. Or they could have just made an immediate rush to action, yet slowed down later on. The problem with these two methods is that they result in different outcomes. The first method emitted much more carbon dioxide than the second. Despite setting a clear start and end point, the emissions end up being drastically different, and could vary even more so depending on how we alter the curve. If we could find this area, then we could calculate the value of extra carbon emissions. But there's just a couple of questions. How do we even start? What does area have to do with functions? How does this relate to anything in calculus? Well, let's find out. Alright, before we get into the specifics, there are a couple ground rules that we must set. First of all, our desired operation will calculate area in a finite set, meaning it calculates area in a set, upper bound, and lower bound, rather than the whole function, as this area will often diverge to infinity, which isn't really useful. Second of all, we want to find the true area, rather than a simple approximation. Even if this approximation is extremely, or sometimes infinitely close, Finally, for the sake of naming, let's call this operation of area an integral. Alright, so where do we even start? Well, there exist two methods of thinking about an integral. We could think about it in either a mathematical sense or just logical thinking. We'll start off with the maths, as that's likely what you came here for. Let's start with separating the graph into columns. Each column has a height of the current fx, and the next column has a height of fx plus dx, where dx represents a change in x. Each column has a length of dx, meaning that each shape has an area of the current function value multiplied by dx. To follow the first of our ground rules, we will have the area calculated between two constants, a and b. Make sure to remember that this dx will be shrunk to zero, as we take a limit. We can use sigma notation to express this area, and once we're done, we are left with this formula. This formula can calculate the exact area of every single function, and although this seems cool, this isn't really useful. The first problem is that we use both limits and sigma notation which goes against our desire to calculate an answer in closed form. The second problem is that this method isn't very powerful and practically impossible to use without a calculator. For these reasons, our task to calculate the area isn't complete. Let's take an example of an area that we definitely know, the simple linear equation of x equals y. If we look closer, the area underneath this curve, or line rather, is equal to a triangle, with equal height and length. We know that the area of a triangle is simply equal to half of its length times height, or in this case, half of x squared. 
All right, so we can say that half of x squared is the integral of this graph, or the integral of x. This is an example of an integral that we definitely know. At any point in the graph, its area is equal to half of x squared. Now, some of you may be asking, what about the lower and upper bounds? Well, when the area is calculated between a and b, its area is equal to this triangle of side length a minus this triangle of side length b. This is quite interesting, as despite having a lower and upper bound, all we need is one single expression to calculate the area. Now that this is done, we know that all we need is one expression. We simply need to calculate what the relation between the expression and the original function is. Well, doesn't something about this seem familiar? If it doesn't yet, then let me ask you something. What's the derivative of x squared divided by 2? Let's use the power rule and have the exponent jump in front of the expression. The derivative turns out to be x. This would mean that x squared divided by 2 is the opposite of a derivative to x, or an antiderivative, if you will. Does this mean that an integral is the opposite of a derivative? Possibly, though we need to generalize this for it to be true. Let's go back to that carbon emission example. The y value is measuring the rate of carbon emission, or to generalize things, the rate of change. This area, on the other hand, measures the actual amount of carbon emissions. The relation between the area and the actual graph is that the graph is a derivative of the function responsible for area. This also means that the relation between the graph and the area is that the area's function is an antiderivative of the original function. This proves that the integral of a function is actually the opposite of a derivative. Alright, we found a definition of an integral that satisfies our ground rules. It calculates exact area, and the area calculated can always be expressed in closed form. To make things easier to notate, let's write the integral as a giant, fancy, extremely hard to write s. Representing the summation of the area between a lower bound and an upper bound. On the right of this s, let's write the area of a single column, which is the current fx multiplied by dx. This is the proper notation for an integral evaluated at bounds of a and b. Now that we have this established, let's try an example question. Find the area underneath a parabola of x squared between x equals 1 and x equals 3. First of all, we need to find the integral of x squared, or the inverse derivative as we've proved. We can think of it as adding 1 onto the power of x, and dividing the whole thing by this new power. We found the integral to be x cubed divided by 3, and we can check if it's correct by differentiating it. And yep, it gives us the original function of x squared. Now all we need to do is substitute 3 and 1 into this integral. All that's left is to solve for 3 cubed divided by 3 minus 1 cubed divided by 3, which equals out to 9 minus 1 third. This is called definite integration, where we have a clear upper and lower bound to calculate area in. There also exists indefinite integration, where rather than calculating the actual area, we find the expression to calculate the area in this case being x cubed divided by 3. But that's for another video. For now, let's recap what we learned. Integration is a method of calculating area under a curve. It's the opposite of differentiation. And we often use bounds to calculate area in. Anyways, that's all for this video. Bye!